Welcome to the Johnson Corners Wesleyan Church Palm Sunday service. My name is Jason Gressman, the pastor here. Just want to welcome you and thank you for being a part of our service here this morning. Want to open with some prayer as we get started. Father God, just thank you so much, Lord, for still giving us an avenue to gather together, Lord. We may not be here physically together, Lord, but we can we can definitely still gather in spirit, in our homes, in our vehicles, wherever we may be right now watching this message, Lord, that... Um, this would be a time for us to worship and meet together in your name and in your glory. Lord, we just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God and firm foundation, our rock, the only solid ground. The nations rise and fall. Kingdoms once strong now shaken, we trust forever in your name. The name of Jesus. We trust the name of Jesus, you are the only king forever, almighty God we lift you higher, you are the only king forever, forevermore, you are victorious, you are the only king forever, almighty God we lift you higher, you are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious. Unmatched in all your wisdom, in love and justice you will reign, and every knee will bow. We bring our expectations, our hope is anchored in your name, the name of Jesus. Oh, 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 we trust the name of Jesus. You are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only forever forevermore you are victorious you are the only king forever almighty god we lift you higher you are the only king forever forevermore you are victorious victorious you are the only king forever almighty god we lift you higher you are the only king forever forevermore you are victorious
Lord, thank you for allowing us to still gather here this morning. Lord, Lord, we just ask, and in this time, and in this message, Lord, you would be opening our hearts to receive the word that you would have for each and every one of us here, Lord, that we have the opportunity to, to hear from you. Just help settle our souls and rest where we are, Lord, so that we can, we can hear from you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Just want to welcome everyone for our Palm Sunday service one more time here this morning. I want to kind of set the stage of where things are. This is the point right before uh, Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, this triumphal entry. So at this point, he's, he's very well known uh, in the region, in the area. The, the claim of Son of God is on his, on his head at this point. He's been performing miracles. He's been teaching. 
He's been been reaching the, the lost and the people around him, the sinners and, and those uh, throughout the region are, are becoming well known of the name of Jesus as, as the Son of God. And so we're getting to a place now where he's, a, he's, he's on his way to Jerusalem. And with him on his way to Jerusalem, uh, the word is going ahead of them. So, so there's this, this knowledge that he's coming. They know he's on his way. And as I've been studying through the week and, and trying to pick up some different little pieces that God would have for me in the Gospels and being in all four of them, there's really a, a really big emphasis on the Gospels in this point especially. In all of Jesus' life, the majority of the Gospels focus on the last few weeks of his life. When we look at, at Matthew and Mark, the majority of what's written are the last weeks of Jesus' day. A third of those two books are all about this time. A quarter of the book of Luke is about the last weeks of Jesus's life. And the book of John, almost nearly half of it is all about the last weeks of Jesus from this point on. So I wanna pick up in Matthew chapter 21, verse one, and kind of walk through uh, what Palm Sunday is all about and what it's gonna to mean to us. And so we pick up here in verse one, and it says, now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. You know, that phrase of them showing up and, and them taking someone's ride from them and saying, No, 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 it's okay. The Lord needs it. Like, this has always baffled me. I, I think about it. So there's someone in our congregation right now, and they have a, a really nice white Mustang in their garage. Let's call it a pony, okay? And I am pretty sure that if I showed up at their house this afternoon and said, you know, I'm going to take this pony out for a ride, and they came out and they caught me getting into this pony to take it for a ride, I don't think if I said, you know, the Lord needs this, that that person's going to be okay with me just taking it and bringing it back later. And so this has always kind of baffled me that even with the, the knowledge of all that Jesus has done and them knowing who he is and what he's accomplished and now that he's there, that these, these two men show up to take this and this guy is just okay with that. And of all things, a donkey. Like, why a donkey? Zechariah 9.9 9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Well, the donkey is everything for the validation of coming into Jerusalem at this time. It's the fulfillment of of the prophecy. It's the whole explanation behind the party that's to come. You, you wonder why everyone is willing to take their cloaks off and lay it on the ground for this donkey to walk over. You wonder why everyone is rushing to, to cut down palm leaves and branches and to cheer him on. All the Jews would, would know this prophecy. And not only would they be familiar and know this prophecy, but for the last couple years, they've been listening to all the miracles, all the stories, all the things that Jesus has done. And now it's creating a stir. It's creating an excitement, uh, a bit of anticipation, and, and some unknown behind this idea of, the, of freedom that will be coming from the king. And so here he's bringing this message of hope and an expectation is starting to build. We read in verse six that the disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them, why they brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks and he sat on them. What an entrance that is. Think about the picture of that as the king that has been awaited is coming in. This is a time that they've heard about. This is a time that they've read about, that they've studied, that has been a part of the anticipation coming through the culture. And in that, the fulfillment of the prophecy is right in front of them. They'll be able to see it. They'll be able to touch it. They, it it's happening 
right then. Think about the excitement that is building in this time. And it's going to produce a boldness in them. We read in verse 8, it says, Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and the others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The book of Mark says, And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they cut from the fields. We look in the book of John, it says they took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. You know, this is where we get the name Palm Sunday. The palms are a symbol of Jesus being recognized as the King. They signify victory and triumph. History shows us that there were actually two entries on this day into Jerusalem. Jesus' famous triumphal entry comes in from the East Gate, which is also known as the Golden Gate. But we also see that there's another one that comes in. Pilate comes in with chariots and soldiers in all his glory, showing off his presence, his power, and his authority as the Roman leader. He knew that rebellion was something that was going to cost him. And eventually Caesar would ask his life if he could not control the rebellion that happened in the areas that he was responsible for. So he came in just showing off all that he was to say, here I am, you need to behave yourself. And I wonder how that, that conflicted within the people of the area. I wonder what they thought when they saw both of these, the, the triumphant, entry of Jesus on a donkey and the entry of Pilate with all of his soldiers and, and his glory. You've got one that's flexing his muscles and another one who's humbly strolling into town. You have one that's demanding rule and reign with an iron fist and you have another one offering up his rule and reign by choice. It makes me think of a few questions. First, have you ever asked Jesus into your life? Have you surrendered in believing in Jesus? Have you ever made the decision to follow Jesus? Because if you haven't, we can do that right now. As a matter of fact, Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. What that means is when we realize we have all sinned, we're all on the same playing field that you are no better than me and I am no better than you. And, and in this, that we have all messed up. When we realize that we have sin in our life, which is just willful transgression, that's, that's us knowing that we have done something to separate us from the Lord, and we have willfully done that, then we can realize that we need help. We need a savior in our life. When we read in Romans 6, 23, it says, for the wages of sin is death. That means as long as we stay in the sin and we willfully choose that, our reward in the end is eternal death. And we have an option. We have a doorway that we can choose that would bring life to us. The rest of that scripture in verse 23 says, but the, Lord, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. What that means is, is that God himself is giving us a free gift. And it's through his son, Jesus Christ. When, when scripture tells us Jesus himself says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and only to the Father, you can come through me. We have to choose him. We have to go through Jesus and believing in him. We can have that life and it is a free gift. But like all gifts, gifts have to be received. We have to take it. You know, and a lot of times we think because uh, we read our Bibles, because we just think that we know about Jesus, that we are saved. I think oftentimes we assume that our children and because we go to church and the people who go to church are saved. And I'm telling you, that's not the way it is. We need to be able to invite people to be a part of this gift. And we need to offer it to them so that they can receive it. Here a few weeks ago, I had the great honor and privilege to walk my daughter through salvation, and she chose to accept Jesus Christ. And when she did, praise the Lord, the angels threw a party, the heavens exploded with joy because she accepted Jesus. 
we all have to do that. We can't just assume that because we, we go to church or because we read something that we are saved. We still have to receive the gift that is offered to us. Romans 5, 8 says, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That means we, we don't deserve this gift, that he gave up his son. He's offering this gift even though we are sinning, that we have sinned. That means we can never work for it enough. We can never be good enough. We can never be better at a point that we earned it. We will never deserve it. We have to receive it as the gift it is. His son, Jesus Christ, died on that cross for my sins, for all of our sins. And we have to accept that he as the sacrifice for our sins. Romans 10, 8 through 10 says, but what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For the heart, one believes and is justified. And with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. You know, I know a lot of people that know of him, that can give you the right answers. But there is a really big difference between someone that walks around telling people about Jesus and talking about how Jesus is because they know of him compared to someone who has received this gift and has a relationship with him. Well, not only are we supposed to continually confess about him our whole life, but it has to be in our heart. We have to believe with what we are. And when we do, that will become an overflow out of our heart, through our actions, through our words, how we help one another, how we treat each other, how we care for one another, and it becomes who we are because we become what we received in that gift. If this is the first time that you've ever walked down the road of salvation, I want to pray with you right now. I also want to invite you to privately message me and I will call you I will, I will text you, I will message you, I will help you find a, a home church, uh, some people to be able to ask questions to, a place to be able to, uh, to call home that will help you through this journey as you accept Christ. So if this is the first time that you are accepting this and then you have heard this, I wanna pray for you right now. Father God, I just pray with all that we are, Lord, that there is a rejoicing of the angels in heaven, Lord, that, that heaven is rejoicing with those who are giving their life to you right now, Lord, and accepting you, Jesus Christ, as Lord and Savior. That they just don't know of you, Lord, that they know you. Lord, I would ask that you would give them the confidence and strength to tell someone else right now, to message them, to call them, to confirm this in their life and help them find the help they need. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, the second thing that it kind of brings to mind in question is if, if you're someone who have already accepted Jesus Christ in your life, I wanna ask you this. Have you given rule and reign totally over to Jesus in your life? What I mean by that is there's still places in your life that he doesn't rule and reign. When, when we talk about rule and reign in, the, in Jesus, when we accept Jesus, he takes over parts of us. His kingdom is anywhere we allow him to rule our life, where we allow him to sit on the throne of our hearts. So because of that, we may still have areas in our life we haven't fully given over to him. Maybe it's an area of your decisions and your choices. Maybe you're making your decisions and your choices based out of fear uh, out of your personal wants, out of some, some selfishness, and maybe a little less out of what God's will is for your life and getting something or, or choosing to do something. Maybe your finances. Maybe you've never given them over to the Lord and maybe he's asking you to now. Maybe you have a ministry and he's asking you to, to give that to his will, to overcome the things in life that he would ask you to overcome. Maybe he's asking you to look at some pride in your life. Maybe he's asking you to look at some character in your life. Maybe he's asking you to just change and you just aren't willing to do that yet. Those are the places of our life that we can, 
we can continue to give him rule and reign over so that we walk in the will of the Lord and not in our own personal will. Look to wherever you can give him more of yourself. You know, when we continue to read in this story, the crowd is pretty much primed at this point to receive Jesus. We see in verse 9, it says, And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, this, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. You know, the crowds followed Jesus into the city because they had heard all that he had done. The things he had done in his ministry the years before, the, the, the miracles, the, the helping of one another, the healings. Um, he enters the city with people welcoming and cheering him on as the saving king. It's a time when the Jews are filling in to Jerusalem for Passover. It is packed with Israel. But the people didn't understand why Jesus was really there. We see it in what their cheer was for him. Hosanna to the son of David. The, they call him a prophet, just a prophet. In that, this is the idea and perception that Jesus is coming to overthrow the Romans. They missed the point of why Jesus was really there. And we can do the same thing. We can miss the point of why Jesus is really here. He, we sometimes have the expectation that Jesus is going to rescue us from our situation, our circumstances, or our struggles. And he absolutely can. But he doesn't always. A lot of time, though, our faith is based on our rescue. The reality is, Jesus isn't interested in taking over Jerusalem. Jesus is interested in taking over your heart. We read here in Luke 19, it goes to verse 39. It says, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, Jesus said, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. You know, the Pharisees were more interested in keeping things quiet and in order. They also wanted to quiet the crowd, to show the crowd their authority, even their authority over Jesus. And I think sometimes in our life, we want to be a quieter. We want to be someone who quiets things down. We want to be someone who makes it the way we want it to be. And because of that, I think sometimes we think we know what's best in this life. I think sometimes we make decisions in our best interest, not necessarily the will of the Lord. I think sometimes we just want to sit quietly because we don't want to upset the apple cart. What we need to be concerned with is the will of God and a kingdom perspective. We need to understand what it's all about. Jesus came for the lost. He came to serve, not to be served. Everyone had a different expectation of the reality of the situation. And if we're not careful, we will too. And because everybody's reality and expectation was different, Jesus knew it. And this is what Jesus did. In, in Luke 19, verse 41, it says, As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. And he said, If you even, even you had only known of this day, what would bring you peace? But now it is hidden from your eyes. The days against you and encircle you and hymn you on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Jesus wept because they didn't get it. God showed up and he knew that they were going to reject him. Jesus is here for the lost and for the hearts of the lost and our hearts. That means the point is life and life in Jesus. John 11:25 says, I am the resurrection and the life. 
he who believes in me will live even if he dies. See, Palm Sunday is a reminder of the reign of Christ and how far greater that is than any plan that any man would ever have for these days. That God has it all in control. That his way is so much better. We, all, we oftentimes look for someone to, to, to fight our battles. But Jesus came to fight the final battle, the battle over death. This is the greatness of why we celebrate this week. Because Christ's ultimate sacrifice, his sacrifice, we can be set free from death. We have so much to be grateful for this week. And I, I want us to really focus on what we should be grateful for. And one of, the, one of the ways we can do that is to keep our focus on a kingdom perspective, to look towards the kingdom of heaven, to look for Jesus. Hebrew 12, 2 tells us, let us fix our eyes upon Jesus. Hebrews 3, 1 says, fix your thoughts upon Jesus. If we do that, our focus is Jesus. And so next Sunday, we will be celebrating Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday. And we're going to have a special time launch at 1030. So it'll be a little bit earlier than our 11 o'clock. So there is a time change as it being a special for Easter and Resurrection Sunday. We are also going to have communion next weekend. And so whether you want to get the elements yourself and be prepared, I will, I will lead you through that so that you can do it at home. Or if you need me to bring you the elements or you need to stop by and pick up the elements, I will have some elements to be able to give you so that you can take communion next weekend with us all together as a family. So if that's something that you want, please call, text me, message me, send me whatever you need and I will get that to you or we can have it ready for you to swing by and pick it up. Would you please pray with me? Father God, we just are so thankful, Lord, for your continued love and presence in our life, Lord, and we just thank you for not forsaking us. Lord, I would ask that if anybody gave their life here, Lord, that there would be a confidence in them to message me, to, to tell someone, to reach out for the help to find that home, that family, Lord, that they can call their church family, Lord, someone to come alongside and help them in this walk, Lord. Lord, we want to celebrate with them as, as we know the angels are celebrating for anyone who gave their life here today, Lord. Lord, thank you. Thank you that you came to save us, Lord. Thank you for coming to save us who don't deserve it, Lord. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Have a wonderful and blessed week.